Okay. All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Welcome to the third of the Ramadan sessions. Jazakallah uh, khairan for all of you for attending and making it through the rain, which is almost like a state of emergency in California. But uh, alhamdulillah, quick reminder about the sessions. This Ramadan, we've made our theme Ramadan, a month of triumph. So we've been highlighting certain iconic Muslim battles that have happened or have taken place throughout the month of Ramadan. Uh, and of course, there are many more than just these four, um, both within the life of the Prophet ﷺ, as well as throughout Islamic history. But we chose these four particularly because they are relevant to the themes of the current genocide that we're witnessing in Gaza. Uh, so these events either happen in or near the month of Ramadan. Uh, two of them happened during the Prophet's life, so the Battle of Badr and the liberation of Mecca, and we covered those in the previous weeks. Uh, and two of these happened in the uh, Blessed Lands of Palestine. So we have the Battle of Ain Jalut, which is covered this week, and the Battle of Fatlin, which will be covered next week. Um, and in doing so, we wanted to, one, decenter Western perspectives that the only history that we as Muslims can draw on, or humanity as, as a whole can draw on, are those of the West. And we want to show that there are alternative ways that people have thought about themselves and alternative ways that people have mobilized. Uh, we also are committed Muslims who find meaning and authority in the lessons of the Prophet Sallallahu and people that are meaningfully committed to the Islamic history uh, that we witness, both the ups and the downs. So we have with us today Dr. Mohsen Ali. Dr. Mohsen is a U Chicago grad, a graduate from Nadr al-Ulama in Lucknow, uh, and recently completed his PhD from UCLA. Uh, his doctoral dissertation was on was a global history of modern Muslim historical writing, uh, and it focused on the approaches of Muslim scholars in colonial and post-colonial India uh, who wrote on the subject in both uh, Arabic and Urdu. Uh, Dr. Mohsen is also in, uh, is the instructional design and outreach specialist for the humanities and social sciences departments of the Eugene and Maxine Rosenfeld uh, Management Library and the Charles Young Research Library at UCLA. Uh, and some of his lectures can be found on al Arkham Institute if that's something that interests you. So make sure to check out our social medias, inshallah. And without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salamu ala rasulullah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala amma ba'd. I'd like to thank al Arkham Institute for organizing this year's events, um, the uh, Korean Brothers, for taking charge um, and for allowing me to participate uh, once again. Um, uh, I was excited uh, when I heard about this topic. Uh, I'm not, uh, my training isn't in, in really in medieval Islamic history, uh, but I was excited uh, to sort of delve into the sources and learn about this topic um, as I was preparing to present. Um, and I, also like to thank my wife who's at home right now with two crazy babies <laughs> who she was trying to put to sleep. Um, they were throwing stuff at her as I was leaving the house. So she's holding down the fort so I could be here um, to this for this presentation. Um, I'm just gonna sort of jump into this presentation. All right. Um, so if you were to be alive, say around the year 1200, the early 1200s, um, and you were thinking about the powers that existed, uh, it was likely that you would think that the emerging power for the future would be the Khwaraz Khwarazm Empire, um, which was centered here um, in parts of modern day Iran and Central Asia, but really it was an expanding power. Um, it was the most powerful empire in Asia at the time, definitely the most powerful uh, Muslim polity. Um, and it was even threatening, it was, it was ruled by Sunnis, but it was even threatening uh, Baghdad. Uh, the Baghdad, the Abbasid Khilafah was reduced to just uh, Baghdad, and it was in an extremely weakened state. Um, you had other Sunni authorities, you had Ayyubids, uh, ruling and parts of Syria and Egypt. Uh, inshallah, next week, uh, the speaker will talk a little bit more about how they came to power, but basically they were divided. Um, and people paid lip service to the Abbasid Khalifa, but really um, the position was quite powerless outside of Baghdad. Um, and yet, um, within a, a few decades, <laughs> um, the Khwarazm Empire completely vanished. Um, the biggest cities of Islam in Central Asia um, were basically reduced uh, to um, some, even towns. Um, Bukhara, Samarkand, for example. Um, these were places that were once centers of Islamic learning. Um, we hear a lot about uh, ulama 
before the Mongol Empire, who are from uh, these Central Asian lands. Um, the study of Hadith continued to be really, really productive in these lands until the, the Mongol Empire. Um, and in, in a few decades, um, the most powerful empire was reduced. Uh, it completely vanished, actually. Um, and the Mongols were set uh, to conquer not just uh, the Middle East, pushing into Egypt, but also ha um, were pushing into Europe as well. Um, and so this was uh, <laughs> um, the, la the la largest um, continuous land empire in the history of the world. Um, it was also one of the most uh, deadliest episodes in terms of the amount of lives lost uh, in the history of the world. Um, but it, it had um, huge ramifications uh, for, for centuries to come for the future. And so uh, today, um, as I'll be talking about um, the Battle of, of Ain Jalut, the battle that happened in Ramadan, 25th of Ramadan, um, in what is today Palestine, um, slightly north of, uh, of Jerusalem, uh, between uh, uh, a polity that had just emerged, the Mamluk Empire, uh, 1260 is kind of basically when it started. In fact, the actual state wasn't established until a year later, but um, the Mamluk Empire didn't even exist until the 1260. But this group, and we'll talk a little bit about who was involved uh, later on, um, provided the first, well, we might say, major defeat. To, to the Mongol Empire um, in, in the Battle of Angelut and Ramadan. Many of us are familiar with um, the battle to somewhat. There's been a number of lectures online by, by Muslims. There was a recent podcast, um, I believe by uh, NPR or PBS, um, which was quite well produced. Um, so it's not a mystery. Um, uh, so what I want to do today is one quickly rehash the the basic out uh, timeline of events that that led to the battle um and a little bit after that um and then i want to take some time uh to open it up by looking at some primary source documents that i've curated that um in hindsight i spent too much time on uh, perhaps i should have spent a lot less time on it um but i wanted to familiarize everybody with what are some of the sources that we have when we want to discuss and write about and think about the history of the Mongol Empire and and, and the Muslims. Um, how do we know what happened, um, which is not as quite straightforward as you might think. Um, and we'll see there's contradictory sources as well. Um, but this is also, I want uh, us to be introduced a little bit more to how to read uh, like a historian. We don't have to be historians, obviously. Um, in fact, historians are a dying breed. Um, historians, um, there's a huge, historians, people who do history professionally, um, who are trained and spent their day job looking over sources that no one else cares about, uh, that kind of is a dying breed. There's less and less investment in terms of here in America and globally and, and, and that type of work. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there's a lots of historical material online and lots of people claiming like this happened in history and they might give you a snippet of, of, of a source or this happened in history. So it's not just enough to be aware of the sources, but I also want us to think about not only what some of the primary sources are saying, but what they're doing. Um, and this is really important now in the age of social media and chat GPT um, and Google where there's um, a lot of potential for misinformation that seem like it's rooted in actual facts when it's not. Um, even just looking at the sources, I could give you uh, a story about the, the, the uh, Mongol Empire using some of the oldest sources in Arabic and Persian. And the conclusion would be that uh, the Mongols were uh, sent by God because Muslims were... Uh, oppressive towards Sufis. And then when certain Sufi awliya allowed it, the Muslims were able to defeat the Mongols. Right? So we have material and really old Arabic and primary uh, Persian sources. And I could present to say, hey, I have these primary sources. Here's the story. The takeaway being um, for today uh, that, well, it's not too much to do except focus on 
you know, maintaining ties with uh, Sufi Olia and, and trying to improve that. Right? So that would be a story I could tell. I could root it in historical sources. But would it be historically plausible? Would we be asking, like, what is that type of story doing? Um, and it's it would be doing to make us passive, right? Um, now, a good historian, an honest historian, is honest about their position. So my my position is so, uh, as a, a Muslim in Ramadan uh, who's fasting, who believes in the power of worship to connect to Allah and to transform, who is living during a genocide that's happening in the Gaza that's on my mind. And so for me, my position is to present a history that will help us to understand what's going on in a way that won't make us passive, won't make us hopeful, um, but also make us, in a sense, um, active um, in trying to make change. That's not just let the rulers do what they will. Uh, we should focus on ourselves individually, right? So that's not a story I want to tell. Um, and, I, and I think if we look at the variety of sources, uh, my, my conclusions are not going to be um, far-fetched. So a, a quick timeline of events before we get to the sources. Um, and I need my notes. All right, so uh, 1219, 1221, uh, Genghis Khan. Um, most of the presentation I refer to him uh, as Chinggis Khan, um, but I guess over here I forgot that. So Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan um, emerges as a leader um, in, in, the, in the Asian, inner Asian steppes, reunites uh, different uh, nomadic pastoralist tribes um, forming a, a Mongol state. And he was mostly interested in, um, in East Asia and really wasn't interested in conquering um, sort of the Western lands. Um, so sort of coming into West Asia, coming into Persia, coming into Central Asia. Um, by the early uh, 12, by, by this time, by 1219, he had actually um, established himself uh, in Mongolia and in East Asia, and he was interested in building trade relations with the Khwarezm Empire. Um, so he actually, him, he had uh, invested in a caravan and other Mongol leaders um, that was sent to um, Uttarar, which was an important city in the Khwarezm Empire. Um, and in 1218, um, the ruler of the Khwarezm Empire, Sultan Muhammad, killed the caravan. He felt they were spies. Not him, actually. His governor in Uttarar, who was his relative, killed the caravan. Then Genghis Khan asked, he sent a diplomatic mission. He sent ambassadors, some of them who were Muslim. At least one of them was a Muslim, um, asking uh, for some type of punishment for that governor who had killed the caravan um, of, of merchants. They, too, were killed um, instead of the government being punished. So at this point, Genghis Khan says, OK, hold my fermented smear milk. I have to address this, right? So this is when he starts um, his uh, bid to conquer uh, the Khwarezm Empire, the most powerful empire at that time. Um, this context is important because at this point in time, um, there's no indication that uh, Genghis Khan had a sense of a divine mission to conquer the world. Um, there's no sense that the Mongol leadership um, had a sense that they were chosen by a divine entity uh, to conquer the world, right? This, this doesn't exist yet in the Mongol ideology. But um, as a result of, uh, of, of their sort of swift uh, conquest of, of a lot of Islamic land, of the Khwarezm Empire, um, this starts to develop uh, amongst uh, the next generation of, of Mongol leaders that, hey, we have conquered so much land so quickly. Um, we're destined by God to conquer the world. And this becomes a really powerful ideology for the Mongol leadership. It also becomes influential for Muslims who are working for the Mongols, but also who are facing the Mongols and thinking this is a punishment from God to us. And we're going to be looking at that. Um, right, right. So this is the um, the city of, of Uttarar um, in Central Asia um, that was, uh, you know, almost annihilated by Genghis Khan um, and the inhabitants wiped out. And this was a common Mongol tactic that that developed that whenever uh, cities were rebellious, um, they would get massacred. Um, and starting with Uttarar, um, twelve twenty seven, uh, death of uh, Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan. 
um, and his empire is divided among his sons, um, four different areas. But uh, nonetheless, there is one um, sort of great Khan. Um, so 1229, his son Ogede Khan becomes a great Khan. And this is when this ideology of the divine right of conquest um, begins to emerge um, at this point in time. Um, so uh, here's a, a miniature of, of Ogre Khan being enthroned. Uh, 1251, um, Monke Khan, uh, Genghis Khan's, uh, one of the grandsons, becomes a great Khan. And this is when the a more concerted effort to start moving westward towards Asia and then the Middle East and Europe um, starts to happen in a more uh, organized way under under when Monke Khan is the great Khan. Um, so you get in 1258, the Mongol conquest of Baghdad under Hulugu Khan, leading to the end of the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, at least in Baghdad. And I'm gonna, we're gonna be looking at, I wanna spend a lot of time looking at some of the sources around this. Um, it's interesting who gets blamed in, in, in the different sources. Um, and so I wanted to look at some of these sources to see what's going on. Um, so here you can see uh, by 1260, um, the Mongol uh, rule has extended um, going into uh, beyond Turkey, um, parts of, of Europe, actually. And when we say uh, the Mongol rule, they're not conquering every single city. Um, a lot, we're going to see a lot of princes and rulers of, of Muslim kingdoms are allying or becoming sort of servient to the Mongol Empire instead of fighting them. Um, so it's not like they're just destroying every single city. They destroy some. And that sends a message. And most most rulers, Muslim rulers, including the Seljuks, uh, many Ayyubid princes, are are willing to become subservient to the Mongol Empire and keep their position um, as sort of a local ruler um, who who has to obey um, the Great Khan. Uh, 1260, the Battle of Anjalut, um, where the Mamluks of Egypt defeat the Mongols, halting their expansion into Levant. I'll get a little bit later into who the Mamluks were. Uh, Muslim group in Egypt, Muslim rulers, dynasty in Egypt that emerges. Um, but that's when that halts. The, the Mongols don't move past that. Um, they're sort of stopped right here um, after this battle. Um, so here's the, uh, where Angelut happened, um, slightly north of Nablus. Um, it literally means the, the well of Goliath. Um, it's, a, it's an area... In the 1260s, the Mongol Empire splits <clears throat> into four different kingdoms. Um, the Ilkhanate uh, is the one that continues to be the main threat to the Muslims. Um, but the, the Mongol kingdoms are also fighting each other. So you've got the Ilkhanate state here. But then you've got the Golden Horde sort of in the Russian area. Um, they, they're they also fighting the Ilkhanate, so they're, and they also ally with the Mamluks and other Muslims. Um, so it's not just... Mongols versus Muslims, because we'll see a lot of Muslims are with the Mongols, and a lot of Mongols are fighting against other Mongols and allies of the Muslims. Um, so really, after 1260, it's more accurate to say the Ilkhanids versus the Mamluks. <coughs> All right, so the, the Ilkhanid Empire. Um, the other empires are the Golden, what's called the Golden Horde, which is much of Russia, the Chagatai Khanate, and the Empire of the Great Khan which is um, sort of the Yuan dynasty. Um, of these four, uh, eventually, these three, um, the rulers become Muslim. <laughs> so that leads to a slow process of, of sort of Islamization, spread of Islam to a certain degree um, in, in these lands, um, especially um, in Central Asia and going into Russia. So uh, modern countries like Kazakhstan, um, uh, and and parts of of, of Russian areas, you know, that's when you get more and more Islam uh, spreading in those areas. Um, so as I said, the Ilkhan continues to fight the Mamluks um, between um, after the Battle of Anjalut, there still are multiple more, uh, at least four other battles that happened. Um, and some of them are actually, in terms of the people involved, bigger than Anjalut. Um, but um, 
they don't result in any success for the Mongols. That's long term. Uh, the Mongols briefly take over um, Syria again um, around 1300. Um, this is around the time when uh, scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah are in Damascus and the Mongols have taken over. And that's sort of the context for a lot of anti-Mongol fatwas. Um, but uh, there isn't any long-term uh, conquest. Uh, basically, the borders are set the, uh, at the Euphrates, um, the, the Ilkhanid Empire. It doesn't really expand beyond that. Um, but Ghazan Khan uh, becomes Muslim, um, but he still continues to fight the Mamluk Empire. Um, and then by 1345, you get the collapse of the Ilkhanid Empire due to internal strife, and you sort of it's broken up into a bunch of different uh, kingdoms after that. I, I also want to mention that after Ghazan Khan, um, the next ruler, his brother, becomes a Shia. Um, and so after the 1300s, you sort of have a lot more uh, investment in in Shia learning, in, in Shia leadership, 12 uh, Shia, the Imami Shia, um, in a lot of these lands. Um, that's when you get some of the most um, famous scholars, such as Al-Hilli, um, his works uh, that really define uh, Shia fiqh today. It emerges during this period of the Ilkhanate, the, the latter half. Um, so uh, that that's also important to keep in mind because a lot of historians will be reading who were writing in the 1300s, um, the new enemy, the Ilkhanate, is also associated with Shiaism. Um, and so that's important to keep in mind in the background. A lot of the authors that we'll be looking at um, who are writing about the Mongols, there's already an association between the Mongols and, and, and Shias because of that uh, conversion in, in the 1300s. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in the late 14th century, uh, Taimur or Tamer Lane sort of tries to revive the, the Mongol Empire, um, kills a lot of Muslims. It's also very ruthless. Um, that'll be important when we talk about later historians who are writing about the Battle of Anjalut um, at the end uh, while talking about Al-Nukrizi, um, an Egyptian Muslim scholar and historian in the 14th century. He's writing around the time of the new Mongol Empire of Tamer Lane. Um, so that's also important to keep in mind when people are, when you're reading history, like what's going on when people are writing about Battle of Ain Jalut, what do they have in mind when they're writing about this history? Um, and then basically by the 15th century, the remnants of the Mongol Empire disintegrate. Um, in, in parts of Central Asia and Russia, um, descendants of Genghis Khan continue to, to rule in some capacity until even as late as uh, uh, the 1700s. Um, so... But basically, by the 15th century, um, there isn't really um, a Mongol power that's left. All right, so that was a quick overview of timeline of events. Um, all right, yeah, it's a lot of time. Um, so uh, one question, why were the Mongols so successful? Um, any any guesses, any ideas? Um, please feel free to be wrong. Uh, I want to make this a bit more open and for discussion. You have to say it into the mic as well, so. Thank you. Yes, yet. Uh, yeah, so I, from what I understand, there are two things. The Mongols were both very skilled archers and also very skilled horsemen. Uh, and those skills were their two, like, their, their bread and butter. But anytime they conquered new people, they made use of newer tools and technologies and techniques into their conquest style. Could you also yeah. Repeat it the yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh Ziad mentioned that one, they were skilled uh, archers um <clears throat> and, and horsemen. And also they used whenever they conquered people, they utilized um their knowledge and, and skilled craftsmen um into their own, own army. And those were all important factors. Um so we have you know these paintings that show them to be really skilled archers um uh, mounted on horseback. This is not easy to do. <laughs> um I mean uh if have you if you ever gone to like these you know Muslim camps and they have archery there, just standing and shooting is not easy, right? Standing and riding on a horse and shooting frontwards, backwards, sideways, that's not easy. But the average Mongolian, not just Mongolian, but but Central Asian pastoralist nomads, they grew up doing that. <laughs> um, and so uh, so there is this this so it's like this baseline skill that's very useful in a military, military context that already existed sort of with like the average 
Um, and it's not, but the thing is, it's not just Mongolians. Um, a lot of uh, Central Asian Turkic groups. So when we talk about the Mongols, there's just one group, but you also have a lot of Turks, Kipchak Turks, different groups of Uyghurs, uh, other groups that are not exactly Mongolian, sort of related from the same area. They also have were, had these skills. Um, other pastoral nomads uh, also had these skills. Um, a lot of the Turks who are brought into the Mamluk Empire, um, as we'll talk about, the Mamluks were uh, initially slaves that were bought uh, from the Central Asian lands and then freed to become military leaders. Um, they had the skills as well. Um, so it's important, but that's not um, definitive. The use of, of new technology and craftsmen is really important. Um, uh, they were very keen on making sure they were using Chinese gunpowder and uh, bringing a look uh, siege catapults. Um, uh, so that was important factor as well. Um, any other ideas, other reasons, uh, Hutan? There are also a couple of ones. Yeah. Go ahead and uh, mention those first. Uh, Ahmed writes, they employed a similar tactic to the West, I assume, sheer brutality. And then Yunus, Yunus writes, and other nations were divided politically as well. Yeah. So in terms of um, the brutality, uh, that that's a, become the common trope. Uh, but the the things they were doing was not too different from like some of the stuff that the Khwarezm Empire had done in terms of massacring in, uh, entire city of Muslims. Um, <clears throat> the Mongols were just more successful at conquering cities, so they were able to do it uh, much more often <laughs> because of their military success. Um, but huge massacres, especially even amongst Muslims, were not unheard of. Um, but that that become the trope specifically for Mongols. So, um, and the Mongols perpetuate this, like we will massacre you like nobody else has to instill fear. Uh, Futan? Uh, yeah, so, so I was gonna go on that, that intimidation factor and consistent on a consistent basis. Usually that was what they call is if you constantly doing something, then uh, especially in the warfare, uh, you conquer somewhere and before you even be able to mobilize, you continue the next one and next one. And this usually uh, shocks the wherever you has been attacked for them to recover and they just, you know, roll over. And then the, the intimidation factor that like, you know, other places like, oh, they're coming and they already conquered this. So as you were saying, they didn't even have to like conquer other places. They were just willing to give up. And this caused the mass amount of uh, people. Yeah, so that's a really important point. So the fact that they were able to um, sort of keep attacking and, and uh, wear people down, uh, that gets at what's really important because they were extremely organized. Like Genghis Khan, he was a genius at organization. From, uh, for example, he made he, the starting with him, the Mongol army was organized into like units of 10, um, 10, then hundreds, and a thousand, then 10,000. Um, uh, so, so there was like a, a numerically defined like a regiment that he had organized. Um, and they were extremely organized in terms of planning their attacks. They used a lot of spies, they used a lot of merchants um, as spies. Um, they were they put a huge premium on fact finding and scouting before they took any action. Um, and even when they ha had become a large empire, um, like Ogadai becomes a great Khan, um, the council decides and determines where the entire, how the operations will happen. Um, everything is coordinated. So there's a level of organization at a time when all the Muslim polities are extremely divided. Right. So this level of organization that's in, in many ways unparalleled, combined with the extreme disorganization of all the other polities, including Muslims, was really the main factor um, of the Mongol conquest. Um, historian Timothy May, who's um, an expert on Mongol military history, um, has coined the term, um, what do you call it, the uh, tsunami, tsunami strategy of the Mongols. Um, but basically... Um, what would happen, much like how a tsunami, um, the wave crashes and then it pulls back and then it crashes again. Um, so the Mongols, uh, they would use a huge army and crash at one location. And then many of them would pull back and they would try to decimate the surrounding lands or engage preoccupied surrounding cities. Because keep in mind that you don't have centralized armies. Um, if a ruler 
wants a large army, he has to mobilize his allies and his princes in many different cities. Um, and then you get a large army. So the Mongols would make sure to preoccupy all the surrounding areas. And then quickly, because they're riding um, ponies that are quick, um, they would come back and crash again on a single location again. Um, so this combination of crashing, devastating surrounding areas, then crashing again on that location made it really difficult for other uh, polities and empires to mobilize huge resources in numbers quickly enough um, to withstand the Mongol army. Um, all this is to say that um, a lot of the sources, when we read them, ascribe the Mongol success as God's punishment to Muslims. Um, but when we also, and you know, we can't really, we can't tell what Allah wills. But we can use our God-given abilities to understand this world as best as we can. And it becomes clear that the deciding factor really is this level of organization combined with disorganization. Um, and then along with that, the, the fear that they instill. Um, so with that being said, um, uh, if you have access to the Google documents, uh, uh, I think um, we'll go ahead and send them in the chat so on YouTube. Yeah, and I'll also I'll be pulling it up here. But I wanted to do first um, take up some of these questions. We won't be looking at documents for every single question. Um, probably just the first two. Um, was Genghis Khan or the Mongols a punishment from God? Um, so that's the first question I want to take up, and I want to take up this question by looking at some of the earliest sources that we have on on the Mongol history. Um, I'm going to pull up the Google Doc. So this first uh, document, let me increase the zoom. Uh, it's, I don't know why I have Tariq Islam here. Um, oh, yes, yeah, came down. That's why. Sorry. Need to go back up. The first one is from um, this large history, multi volume history called um, Al Kamil Fi Tariq by the scholar Ibn Al Athir. So, the first thing when we read um, a, a document, a historical source, Um, what's, what's the first thing that we should do whenever we come across, um, primary source, a source for history? Any, it's, yeah, I guess it's okay to be wrong. Verifying, trying to find out where, what era that the historian was in, so if it existed before or after. Right. Even before you read the content, find out what, what is a source? Where is it from? Who is it from? Right. So, um, verify, in other words, where is this piece coming from, right? So the first one I have is this chronicle of Ibn al-Athir. Who is, who is Ibn al-Athir? Where is he from? Where was he writing from? When was he writing? Um, so Ibn al-Athir, uh, he's writing from, from Mosul in Iraq. Um, he was uh, writing uh, in sort of what we call the Zengid Empire. Uh, next week, the speaker will talk about Nuruddin al-Zengi. Um, so Ibn al-Athir was from that dynasty. He was an important scholar, scholar of Hadith. Um, one of the last scholars um, becomes really important hadith scholar because he has uh, he has chains of hadith from scholars in East Asia that don't exist after him. Um, so so he's sort of the, one of the last links uh, for people who uh, are into the isnad of hadith to hadith that uh, have isnads that go through the East Asian scholars. Um, but he's writing from Mosul and he died uh, if, if I'm uh, I remember like 1233. Uh, um, so he, he was alive uh, when Genghis Khan is alive um, and he passes away um, slightly after Genghis Khan. Um, so he's a contemporary of Genghis Khan. Um, and so his Arabic history, uh, most of it is devoted to the history of, of, of the Zengids and the Ayyubids and the Crusades of Salah al-Din. Um, but the last part starts to get into the Mongol Empire. Um, so it's a contemporary source from a place that's very far from at that time, the Mongol Empire. 
Um, and so uh, he begins his account. Uh, I'm just going to read the first part, but then I'm going to uh, ask you guys to read the remaining for a couple minutes yourself before I talk about it again. But he begins talking about it by saying, for several years, I continued to avoid mention of this disaster as it horrified me and I was unwilling to recount it. I was taking one step towards it and then another back. Who is there who would find it easy to write the obituary of Islam and the Muslims? For whom would it be a trifling matter to give an account of this? Oh, would that my mother had not given me birth. Oh, that I had died before it occurred and been a thing forgotten, quite forgotten. However, a group of friends urged me to record it, although I was hesitant. I saw then that to leave it undone was of no benefit. But we state that to do it involves recounting the most terrible disaster and the greatest misfortune, one the like of which the passage of days and nights cannot reproduce. And he's saying this after he's written the history of the Crusades, after he's written about how the Crusaders took over Jerusalem and the massacred Muslims in Jerusalem, right? So he's saying, after he's written that history, he's saying this about the Mongols. Um, and then he says, it compromised, it comprised all mankind, but particularly affected the Muslims. If anyone were to say that since God, glory and power be his, created Adam until this present time, mankind has not had a comparable affliction, he would not be speaking the truth. History books do not contain anything similar or anything that comes close to it. All right. Um one reason I chose chose this aside from the fact that it's a contemporary source is that we see um, how he's thinking about why the Mongols are so successful. Um, does he consider them to be a punishment from God? Does he consider them to be a sign of the end of times? How is he trying to explain the Mongol success? Um, and rather than me reading it, um, if you guys can just take a couple minutes to read it yourselves, and then I'll come back and I'll talk about it. And you can stop here. Um, the, the, you don't have to read the Conquest of Bukhara. Okay, so how how is he trying to rationalize and explain um, what's going on with the Mongol conquests? Uh, I'll focus on the word uh, might complete a thing destined to be done, i.e. it's God's destiny. Not that that necessarily removes human agency or action, and, but that's what the emphasis is. Right. So there, he, there is an element that ultimately, you know, it's happening because Allah is allowing it. Um, any other takeaways? There also seems to be this element of um, blaming the lack of leadership within the Muslim lands. Right. So there is this, like, there's no strong defender for Muslims. Uh -huh. Any other important, anything, let me know if there's any online.
And there's also this part that um, the Khwarezm Shah Muhammad had defeated a lot of the other Muslims who might be able to have power. And so there was sort of a power vacuum um, as well. Um, he also recounts the conquest of Bukhara. Um, and I just wanted to um, highlight a few things from it. Um, so I remember Bukhara at this time was one of the intellectual centers of the Muslim world and economic centers. Um, and he mentions that uh, when uh, Chinggis Khan eventually conquered uh, Bukhara and, and broke in, um, he, what he tells the people is this. Um, he, um, he asked that a list of the notables um, and the leaders should be made for him. This was done. Uh, so they did that and the list was handed to him and he ordered all the leaders to be summoned. <laughs> They came and he said, uh, I want from you the bullion that Khwarezm Shah sold you, meaning I want from you what you took from my caravan and the profit you made from my caravan that I had sent. I want that back. Um, and anyone who had it brought it back. Um, and then he ordered them to leave the city. So they all left stripped of their possessions. None of them had anything with them but their clothes uh, he was wearing. And then the Mongols entered the city, plundered it and killed anyone they found there. Um, and then there's this part about um, uh, so Bukhara became wasteland. All right. So then they committed horrid acts with women while people looked on and wept. So there's a lot of um, unmentionable things happening. Um, and then he mentions that there were some who did not accept this, what was going on, um, and chose death instead. And they fought until they were killed. Among those who did this, and chose to be killed rather than see what befell the Muslims were the lawyer, meaning the faqih and imam, Ruknuddin Imam Zadeh and his son, and similarly, um, the Qadi Sadruddin Khan. Right, so um, they they were eventually martyred once they saw what was happening um, in terms of uh, the rape that was happening for the women. Um, I highlighted that part, um, two things, uh, the two parts. What Genghis Khan says to the people, I want my caravan, my treasure back, um, and the reaction of um, this uh, scholar, Ruknadin Imam Zadeh. Um, because now, when we compare it to the second document um, that I have, this is from um, a Persian source, Juvaini, not Imam al Harmain al-Juvaini, but um, uh, this uh, um, historian, but also importantly, a bureaucrat, bureaucrat um, government official who was working um, for uh, the Mongol Empire. Um, he was writing, he, uh, Juvaini, this Juvaini, who wrote um, Tariq um, uh, Jahan Kusha, The History of the World Conqueror. Um, at, um, he wrote it around the time that ba uh, Baghdad was conquered, around 1250, 1260. Um, he was actually present at the conquest of Baghdad. Um, so he's writing decades later from Genghis Khan. So he's not a contemporary like the way Ibn Lathir was. Um, but he is a he's a he's a Muslim Sunni Muslim. Um, uh, his family had been for generations uh, government officials. His father served the Khwarezm Empire. His his ancestors most likely served um, the Abbasid uh, as bureaucrats and government officials. Um, and so now um, he's doing what his family has always done: they're government officials, and he continues to do that for the Mongol Empire. Um, while Hulagu Hu Khan is conquering Muslim cities, he writes his history of Genghis Khan. Uh, and, and the Mongol Empire, um, trying to basically, he's a, he's a Sunni Muslim working for the Mongol Empire who's killed a lot of Muslims. Try to make sense of that. Um, try to put a spin on it, essentially, by saying, yeah, they're not so bad. Um, uh, there's a reason for everything. Um, and so if we look at how he writes about the conquest of Bukhara, um, so what he has to say about it. Um, uh, and um, I'll let you guys read it for a couple of minutes um, and then I'll talk about it.
Okay, so my, my question is, what are some key differences in what Giovanni says and what Ibn Lathir reported? It really makes him sound like a gracious conqueror. In what way? Um, like there's like no mention of like any atrocities committed. Um, he also like gives him like this kind of like divine quality that he's like claiming that he's like the pun he's a the punishment from from Allah because uh like the sultan and the people you know uh, went against the commands of Allah and that like gave his is like somehow like the, like an actual punishment. Right. So that's a really important point. In Giovanni's version, which becomes really influential for all later histories, uh, Muslims, uh, sometimes even re repeated in the Arabic sources, uh, Genghis Khan comes and says, oh, people, know that you have committed great sins. Um, and if you ask me what proof I have, say it's because I am the punishment of God. Right. So I am the instrument of God sent to punish you Muslims. Right. So Ibn Lati did not report this. Uh, Juvaini does, and then everyone, most everyone after him reports this. Um, yeah. Huh? Even NPR. Yes, even NPR. Um, every like popular lecture online repeats it as if this is uh, a fact. Um, before I get into it a little bit more, what's the second difference here between uh, what Ibn Lati had reported? Now I'll give you a clue. It has to do with. Um, uh, uh, Imam Zadeh, Ruknadin Imam Zadeh. What did he do in Ibn Lathir's report, the scholar in Bukhara? He fought to death once he saw a woman being raped. What does he do here in Giovanni's version? Yeah, he tells them, accept it, this is what God wants. Right? Right. So, uh, this is the second, this is a version of is reporting that Imam Zadeh, who was a, who was, um, a, a, you know, sort of a known figure. Um, uh, in, in, in Ibn Lathir's version, fights to death. In this version, he says, just be quiet. It is the wind of God's omnipotence that blows. This is God's will. Just be quiet. We have no power to speak. Right. So we understand what is being said. What is it doing? What is this text doing? Um, did Genghis Khan say this? Um, so there's reasons to trust it. One, uh, Giovanni has access to sources that Ibn Lathir didn't because he's writing from the seat of the Mongol Empire. Um, he's writing, he has a, a access to people who were the insiders. He has access to documents um, that Ibn Lathir didn't. Um, so there, he has that going for him. But what are some reasons to doubt it? He's a few decades later, but what else? I don't know if this uh, will answer the question, but it's like embedded reporters today. Embedded reporters today, they are they are by the source. However, the source will will take them and show them what they want and see. So it is possible that I could see the Jenga Khan saying out of uh, arrogance, you know, I am the punishment and I'm going to kill you guys in that sense versus he's trying to get to see like uh, he's a messenger of punishment from God. Right. Um, so from an outsider perspective, I would think that the independent resource where he goes collect this, he sees a different perspective just like we see today. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that's important that um, he it is convenient that Genghis Khan happens to say exactly what um, Mongols want people to believe now. Um, and it's also skeptical because, as we mentioned before, just know all the, all, the, all the evidences indicate that Genghis Khan had no intention of conquering Muslim lands. Um, if we include, as historians do, like some of the Chinese sources, um, there's not too much Mongol sources, some stuff in Uzbek, uh, not Uzbek, um, in Uyghur, um, but there's no evidence that there's this ideology of, of divine duty to conquest uh, until a generation after Genghis Khan, right? So when we keep that in mind as well, you know, it makes us skeptical that did he really say this? Um, and also, he doesn't speak Persian. So the idea that he'd go to the Eidgah and, and give a sermon to people that don't speak his language and he doesn't speak. So there's reason to be, you know, skeptical that he actually said this. Um, but then we get into like what the text is doing. And what the text is doing 
is that it's creating this Mongol ideology for the Muslims. Um, that uh, as the Mongol Empire is is expanding in Muslim territories, um, and they want more and more more and more Muslims are a part of this empire. They need to figure out how they fit in, <laughs> and the way that Muslims fit in, we're being told, um, is that well, the people we're conquering, uh, we're doing God's work. <laughs> Um, so by joining us, you're helping in, in God's work being done. Um, right. So this, this is what I mean by what, what, what is it doing? This is what it's doing here. Most likely, most likely what it's doing. Uh, Uber is, uh, ethnically Tajik. Um, so the word Tajik, uh, in this time period, uh, it's not exactly an ethnicity. It, it refers more to, uh, people who are like Persian speaking and part of, um, a Persian literati. Um, and it's not exactly necessarily an ethnicity at this time. Yeah. Any any questions before I proceed? Assalamu alaikum. Actually, this opens a big chapter. Just the, what, what Juwaini, so-called Juwaini, wrote versus Ibn Athir. I would accept, of course, Ibn Athir's statements over that Juwaini who accepted for himself to work with the Mongols. That's one point. Uh, the other point is al uh, bin Asir put it clearly, the reasons. One reason he said that the lack of a strong leader. I would translate it to mean the lack of central leadership for Muslims. Keep in mind that when the Mongols came, the, the Crusaders already were still occupying parts of the Muslim land. There is overlap between the Crusaders and the Mongols. Mm -hmm. So at that period of time, the Mongols came, in the, quote, unquote, in the wrong time, if I use this. But the state of Ummah at that time didn't reach to this situation all of a sudden. Uh, for the Crusaders, Muslims already were weak. And when the Crusaders came, some so-called Muslim uh, regional rulers accepted for themselves to help the crusaders and I think maybe next week in Salah I mean this is the time to elaborate on that but the, the Abbasis got weak even before that mm -hmm. we know that the Abbasis went through many stages and they accepted at some stage the self-autonomy uh, in merits and in, in different provinces and the root for that actually goes back to Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, I would say. Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, when he came and the, the Umayyads were almost massacred, one of them managed to reach to al andalus Abdul Rahman al And the concern for Abu Ja'far al-Mansur was, Alhamdulillah, ladhi ja'ala bayni wa baynahu bahran. Thanks God that there is an ocean between me and him. He compromised the unity of Muslims for the sake of his own power. I would say even that was the main, the first reason that caused us to lose Al-Andalus. And all of this without power. The Abbasis got divided. And of course, the Mongols or Hulago found it good after actually Ibn al-Alqami approached it and managed even for a visit that he will visit Baghdad secretly and coordinate with some people uh, in, uh, in Baghdad. Now, claiming that this way I am the punishment of God, it reminded me of something even some Muslims said after 1967 war in the Middle East. I, I, was, I was walking in the streets of Amman Jordan, and there were people gathered around some person who, talk, who used to talk to them and convincing them that Israel has to reach the river of Jordan. You can't object that. So they told him why. He said, because the prophet told us that we will be fighting at the river, so they have to reach. So when I approached, I asked him my question, are you Khabarat? <laughs> so he just left. When asking that question. So they putting everything on the will of God, and of course we do keep everything in Everything runs by the will of God. 
But the will of God does not mean that um, we should be uh, uh, fatalists and should, ex should think that everything is happening against us, that we have no agency and we have no uh, power to change the situation. I would say this is more important than even talking about Ayn Jalut itself, although Ayn Jalut is, alhamdulillah, bright page in our history. Alhamdulillah khair for those comments. We're gonna, I'm going to get into Ibn al qamin right now, but it's really important to keep in mind that, and one of the reasons I wanted to focus on that first part with Ibn Lathir and Atala Javani is that today we do have people that want to say that let the rulers figure out what to do. It's not for us to talk about it. No. Uh, this is up to Allah. You know, He's punishing this community. He's punishing those Muslims for their misdeeds. Uh, um, and that really, if you want to bring about change, the issue is that we have to start with um, not talking about politics, not talking about advocacy, talking about inner issues, vices, diseases of the hearts, prayers, ibadat. And Ibn Lathid provides, uh, he's an excellent historian. His history is translated into English, by the way. Um, but he provides this where he accepts that Allah has full power and everything happens by his decision. But he is looking at it from like what how can this be explained, um, you know, kind of quote unquote rational way, in, in a way that makes sense without having to worry about figuring out what Allah is doing? We don't have access to that, right? So it's not like a, a you know a modern thing um, or a quote unquote Islamist thing to try to figure out um, the issues that are happening with Muslims and find rational explanations. We've got famous hadith scholars like Ibn al Um, and he's he's also a great historian because. If you read about his parts about Salah al he's actually quite critical. Uh, so he's not someone who's just a puppet for Muslim rulers. Um, he doesn't even sphere Salah al -Hadin. So um, we, we have these scholars and historians in our tradition that are critical, that are, are thinking about the whole world. Ibn al is in Iraq, and he's thinking about what's going on all the way in China. Um, and he's getting reports, and he's losing sleep. Um, he's saying the this is the obituary of Islam. No one is listening. <laughs> Um, it, it's kind of like, you know, there's this impending doom coming and Ibn Lathir is trying to wake people up and no one is listening um, for, for decades. Um, yeah, Hutan? So I have a question specifically about Drani. You know, you mentioned his background being in, like, he's not like someone, like, unknown. He's very well known, his family and everything rooted. Um, now the fact that you said, like, the Mongols at that time may not necessarily all of know Persian. So he technically has like a, a, a kind of like a, a middleman between the Mongols and the Muslims. So was the, did he have any um, incentive uh, that based on uh, evidential saying, okay, you know, he's trying to do something to bring that out? Because it's, it's, it's big to really uh, put that in there without the Mongols even knowing that. Or was it the coordinator or collaborator? Do you have anything writing about that? Because that would be very interesting to see how he, uh, like you said, he was like the uh, the fork where it split the the, the ideas and, and, and for the Muslims. So, uh, well, so yeah, I mean, he was in a sense like sort of an official historian. Um, he was um, he basically working for Khulaku Khan. Um, at one point, he was governor of uh, I think of Baghdad after its conquest, um, and. He's getting his information from Mongols, but importantly, you know, his main audience are obviously Persian speakers, and this, a lot of them are Muslims who are now part of the Mongol Empire. Um, and so, a lot of his audience is like trying to trying to make sense of we're we're Muslim. He's a, he's a Sunni Muslim himself. Uh, we're Muslims. We have our Muslim history. How do we make sense of working for the empire? Um, and so, I mean, we and. Um, and that, that's what he's doing here. So like, and one of the things he, he his history doesn't end. So he he witnesses the conquest of Baghdad. 30 minutes? All right. He, he, but he doesn't write about that in his book. He, he concludes his book with the conquest of the Mongols over the, the Ismaili kingdom at Alamut, right? And so the conclusion of his book is that thanks to the Mongol empire, the biggest threat to Sunniism is defeated, the, the Ismailis, right? So that's, his, that's where he concludes his book. Right, so uh, like, look how good you know Allah sent the Mongols and this uh, non-Sunni power that had been threatening Sunnis finally has come to an end thanks to the Mongols. Um, you know, and that's where the book concludes. And 
doesn't say anything about conquest of Baghdad, um, even though he lived he through it and decades later. Um, so so that's how you know. And um, I mean, my point is not to pass judgments on him necessarily. Um, you know, um, you know, Allah knows the states of people who have passed us, those who came before us in Iman. But kind of it is to pass judgment on on people today who might take a similar stance of trying to justify working for the empire, um, using things like this is what God wills um, and uh, provide an alternative in our tradition, such as Ibn Lathir. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on to this next section about the conquest of Baghdad. So is, is there going to be a Q&A after the 30 minutes? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm open to asking questions during it as well, but um, I want to leave more time at the end as well. Um, so next uh, section I want to look at um, has to do with um, the conquest of, of Baghdad um, and how Muslim historians assign responsibility, uh, trying to understand this was a huge traumatic event, even though the, the Khalifa was politically powerless, but he still held a really important position in, in the Muslim imagination. Um, in fact, a lot of people believe that Baghdad couldn't be conquered because Allah is always protecting it. Um, and, uh, even though, uh, it had, was in a weakened state, the, there was this, um, aura around the Khalifa. So like, you know, he was still veiled from most people. It'd be a huge honor for a Muslim ruler to go and see the Khalifa's face. Um, when they would go visit him, they would kiss him. They would bow down and kiss the ground that he was on. Um, so like his body was considered to have baraka, even though politically they didn't, you know, listen to him, but there was something about that, you know? So, so the sack of Baghdad was um, a traumatic event. Um, the con was a traumatic event for Muslims. Um, just because politically it didn't matter, doesn't ma mean that for Muslims it didn't matter, right? Maybe it mattered for the wrong reasons, but it really, really mattered. Um, and so Muslims try to, you know, explain what happened um, decades later, um, try to, find like, okay, whose fault was this? Who, who can we blame? How do we explain it? Um, and a, a lot of uh, the blame falls on uh, a figure by the name, uh, uh, the, the the vizier for the Khalifa, uh, for Al-Mu'tasim, the Khalifa of Al-Mu'tasim, um, Ibn Al-Alqami, right? So uh, if you're not familiar with Ibn Al-Alqami, I remember first learning or hearing about him uh, at a khutbah, um, around 2003, when the invasion of Iraq was happening, where a khatib was saying, just like Ibn al-Alqami let the Mongols into uh, Baghdad, you know, the current Shia in Iraq are letting America and George Bush into Baghdad. Um, and so I didn't know who he was at the time, but um, he's become a stand-in for, uh, in a sense, uh, the the fifth column that are the, the Shias in, in the Muslim world um, a lot of times. Um, and so I had the time, so I want to look into, like, hey, what's, what's going on in the sources that we have available? Um, and so here there weren't um, already translations available. So I tried to do it myself, but I'm not a professional trans translator. So I wanted to keep the Arabic along with it. Um, and if I've made any uh, errors, um, please definitely do correct me. I mean, I, you know, I, this was something that I, you know, I, I, wasn't able to put too much time on. Um, and there are areas where I did get stuck. Um, so the first, uh, again, who is the source? Who is this? Al-Yunini. Um, what is this? Um, the al uh, Al-Yunini was uh, a Hanbali scholar in Damascus. He uh, was uh, probably a child when the conquest of Baghdad happened. Um, uh, he died uh, in the early 1300s, maybe around 1300. Um, uh, and he wrote this book, which is actually a continuation of another history book um, called Mirat al-Thaman, Mirat al the Mirror of, of the Times, the Mirror of the Ages. Um, and so this is an early source um, by someone who was uh, alive during the conquest of Baghdad um, and who has, uh, who's, who's hearing firsthand accounts from people who knew, or uh, secondhand accounts, uh, from people that are hearing things about what happened in Baghdad and are writing about it. So it's one of, um, it's an early source. And I also chose this because a lot of other sources like 
that I'll, I'll have later on, like Imam Dhabi, Ibn Kathir, um, uh, Al-Maqrizi, like they all cite Al-Yuni. Um, so uh, I want to do like, okay, let's let's present this as our first document about what's going on. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight certain passages. Um, so he mentions that it begins by saying, um, uh, so this is, is a chronicle. So uh, the way that these chronicles work is that each, it begins with a year. In this year, this is everything that happened. <laughs> um, so in the year 654 um, of the Hijri, um, uh, Hulaku prepared to march towards Iraq. The reason for this was that Ibn al-Alqami, Mu'ayyid ad-Din Ibn al-Alqami, the vizier of the caliph, was uh, a Shia, a Rafili. And the people of the neighborhood of, of, of Qarkh, Qarkh was a neighborhood in Baghdad that was predominantly Shia, um, there had been some problems there. There were ongoing conflicts between a faction of the Qarkh nobility. Um, the word is used as uh, the Ashraf, so I think it might mean the Sayyids of, of the neighborhood um, specifically. Um, but I just took a more literal meaning because I wasn't totally sure I read nobility and the people of the Sunni neighborhood of um, Bab al-Basra. So there was Sunni Shia fighting going on within Baghdad, according to Al-Yunini, um, this Hanbali uh, scholar. And the people of Bab al-Basra, who were Sunni, complained to Rukn ad-Din, ad, um, ad actually, I, I think it's supposed to be ad-Dawadar, not ad-Dawadar, but they complained to Rukn ad-Din and to the Khalifa's son, Abu Bakr. <clears throat> the Sunnis said about this Shia Sunni conflict. And these two told the soldiers to plunder Qarkh. So the uh, soldiers attacked the Shia neighborhood. Uh, and they killed, committing severe atrocities. <clears throat> Other sources mentions that are more explicit that the severe atrocities are, are rape. <clears throat> and the people of Qarkh complained to Ibn al-Alqami, who ordered them restraint told him to be patient, don't do anything, but he secretly harbored resentment against the caliph due to this matter. The previous caliph, Al-Mustansir, had amassed a large army, <clears throat> said to number around 100,000 soldiers, including many prominent commanders, each of whom had was referred to as king. So uh, the previous khalifa had a, made a huge army. But this new khalifa, Al-Mustasim, when he came to power, he, consult, he, he was counseled. Right, so the, the passive is used. Um, <clears throat> Ushira alihi. Right, so he was counseled. It's not clarified explicitly who gave this counsel. But in the al Yunis account, he doesn't say that. Okay. Right? So I just want so in, the, in this early account, it's not mentioned explicitly who, who gives this counsel. Um, later sources say that he did it. But I think it's important to note that Al-Yunini doesn't mention that explicitly. But he was counseled to reduce his, his army, to make it smaller. Um, because it'd be enough to just to pay the Mongols tribute, we don't need to worry about fighting them. Because as long as we pay them, they're not going to come. So he reduced the number of soldiers. Then Ibn al-Qami corresponded with the Mongols, hoping to gain control of the land. He sent his slave and brother to them, offering them the governance, op, um, offering meaning um, saying that he will be the governor of Iraq on their behalf. And the Mongols promised him that and began preparing to march towards Iraq. <clears throat> this is an important person. The Mongols also wrote to Badr ad-Din Lu'lu. Right? I'm going to be talking about more. Right? Um, I had never heard of him before. But the Mongols also wrote to Badr ad-Din Lu'lu, the ruler of Mosul. Badruddin Lutlu was the first one to uh, uh, in the Middle East to uh, from Muslim countries who was a former slave to become the ruler of that kingdom. So he had been a slave of the Zengis and then became the ruler, kind of like what happens at the Mamluks in Egypt. So he he sets a sort of a precedent. Um, uh, he was in Iraq, um, where Ibn Lathir had been writing from. So he over to the Zangis, he became the ruler of Mosul. The Mongols had contacted him and told him to provide them with the necessary war equipment. Talk a little bit more about that later as well, which he did. When Badr didn't realize what the Mongols intended, 
as if he didn't know what the Mongols were going to do with the war equipment beforehand. He secretly warned the Khalifa of the Mongol treachery and that he was preparing for war against him. The, the vizier Ibn al-Qami prevented anyone from telling the caliph that the Mongols are attacking. When one person did uh, warn the caliph the, about the Mongols, the caliph paid no heed and God did not want him to awaken. Right. Um, so it's a little bit more information about <clears throat> the Mongols come. Um, a great battle happens uh, after the defeat. Um, I'm going to move on a little bit on uh, this interest of time. Um, so when the Mongols have besieged Baghdad and uh, Baghdad's army has been defeated, uh, Ibn al-Alqami um, tells the Khalifa to negotiate with Hulaku. Um, and he asked, uh, he asked the caliph um, if he could go, meaning if Ibn al-Qami could go to meet with Hulaku, and the Khalifa lets him. So he goes out, he gained assurances from the Mongols for himself. So he makes a deal with the Mongols for himself, and then he returns to the Khalifa and tells him that Hulaku Khan um, wants his daughter to marry your son, Abu Bakr. Um, <laughs> He wants the daughter of the Khalif, Khalif to be married to the son of Hulaku. Yeah, okay. Which, to me, his daughter. Uh, okay. But basically, he wants a marriage between the families. Um, and if you do this, he'll keep you as the Khalifa. Similar to what he's doing with the Seljuk Sultan. So by this time, the Seljuks have become vassals to the Mongol Empire. And he says, it'll be basically like what it used to be when the Khalifas were vassals of the Seljuks beforehand. Um, it's not going to be that different. Um, and that he's not going to interfere with you as long as you obey him. If you agree to this, you're going to prevent the shedding of Muslim blood. And afterwards, you can do as you please. After the army leaves, you can do what you want, right? So the Khalifa goes, this is a good idea. Um, I have no army. They're, I can just don't escape. Um, so they go out. Um, and basically, they, they get massacred. They get slaughtered. He goes out with his whole entourage and all the scholars, and, and they all get slaughtered. And they... Um, and then the conclusion, though, is that um, uh, as for the minister, Ibn al-Qami, he did not achieve what he wanted and died shortly after. May God show him what he did to the Muslims. Right. <clears throat> so, um, and there's also a question about how the Khalifa was killed. Al-Yunini says we don't exactly know. So basically, we'll be, it's a few important points here. One, Al-Yunini says that someone had counseled the Khalifa. So there was Sunni Shia fighting going on in Baghdad. Someone had counseled the Khalifa to reduce his army. And then Ibn al-Qami um, had contacted, take the initiative to contact the Mongols and invited them to come and conquer, right? And so that's how the conquest of, of, of Baghdad is explained. We've got this, um, the Shia traitor. Uh, Ibn al-Kathir um, basically follows a similar thing, um, mentions um, that it was Ibn al-Qami who enticed them to take over the lands. Um, and he did this by telling them about how weak the the Muslim army was. Um, oh, and this, all right, so Ibn al-Kathir makes it more explicit. Um, the minister Ibn al-Qami had been diligent before in managing the armies and removing their share from the payroll. So uh, Ibn al-Kathir is writing um, almost like half a century after Al-Yunini, um, like decades later. Uh, and He's also writing after the more support for the Shias in, in the Ilkhanid Empire. He makes this explicit that it was Ibn al-Alqami who actually destroyed Baghdad's army, right? It wasn't um, someone advising the Khalifa, no, it was Ibn al-Alqami himself. <clears throat> um, and not only that, he, he adds more that, that wasn't in the earlier source, um, that Ibn al-Alqami was hoping to eradicate the Sunnah entirely that he wanted to promote Shi'i innovations, and he wanted to establish um, a, oops, a Fatimid Caliphate, even though Ibn al-Qami is Ibn Ashari. But, um, but all of this backfired, and he was humiliated. Um, he became subservient to the Mongols after having served as viziers to the caliphs. And he, he bears the sin of everybody who was killed. Um, I didn't understand what this word meant. Um, that Ibn Kathir says that uh, the Mongols جَعَلَهُ فُشْكَاشًا لِتَتَارِي بَعْدَ مَا كَانَ وَزِيرًا الْخُلَفَةِ I think it's like a Persian or Turkish word, فُشْكَاشًا. 
but it's it's. I never read it. Okay. But they actually they they just ignored it. All right. So based on context, I just translated as they made him subservient to the Mongols after he was a vizier to the Khalifas. Um, all right. So so we see that more details have been added a few decades later. Um, in in a, a Persian source that's actually contemporary, actually predates even Al Yunini. Um, the uh, in the Delhi Sultanate, the Delhi Sultanate in India, in North India, had not been conquered by the Mongols. Um, there had been a few skirmishes, but the Mongols um, had not been interested in in moving in that direction. Um, so you've got this uh, historian in the Delhi Sultanate, contemporary um, Sunni uh, Al Jusjani. Uh, it was different from the Mongol Empire. Uh, yeah, yeah, they become also slave soldiers, become rulers, right? Um, uh, but, but so you have a contemporary source. He's writing in Persian, um, in his uh, Persian history, Tabaqat al Nasiri, um, and he also mentioned a few important points. Again, it's Ibn Al Qami's fault, right? So there's this, even from a source that's contemporary but removed, um, is also saying this, um, uh, and that uh, there's you know slight differences um, that there's a there's tension going on between some of the entourage and Ibn al-Qami. Um, but he also mentions that um, a point that the others don't mention. Uh, when Hulaku sent out towards Iraq, the Malik of Mosul, whom they were wont to, to style Badruddin Lutlu, on whom be the almighty curse. Right. So Al-Juzjani says, you know, Al-Badruddin Lutlu Mal'un, like, Ibn Kathir and al Dhahabi and other historians, you know, say that Ibn al Qami is cursed. Al Juzani says, no, not just Ibn al Qami, but the Lutlu al Mal'un as well, um, because he assisted the infidel army. I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit more about who he was in a bit. Um, and then, but basically, uh, uh, and he also adds more about him. For some time, the infidel uh, Mongols desired to detain the Lord of the Faithful. Meaning, for some time, the Mongols didn't want to kill the Khalifa. They wanted to just uh, imprison him. Um, and there were a lot of Muslims who had said, in part of the Mongol Empire at the time, who said, if, um, if, if Hulaku Khan should pour out the blood of the Khalifa on the ground, both he and the Mughal army will be swallowed up in an earthquake. And therefore, it behooves him not to slay him. So a lot of Muslims were saying, if you kill him, there's going to be a calamity because there's this barakah in him. You can't kill him. Badrun Lutlu, according to Juzjani, says, um, kill him. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> um, um, and then he was rolled up um, in a leather sack and he was um, sort of kicked to death. Right. So there's more mentioned in this source about this figure than Badrun Lutlu, the ruler of Mosul. Um, there's another contemporary account by Nasir al-Din Atusi, a Shia. Um, where uh, he doesn't mention this tussle between Ibn al-Qami and the Shias and the Sunnis in Baghdad. Um, he gives a different explanation for why, for why Hulagu attacked Baghdad. And I think it's important to consider it as well, even though he was working for the Mongols by this time, Atulsi was, and even though he was um, a Shia, um, it gives more context that we don't get from the Sunni scholars. Um, and this is that, uh, so Hulaku Khan had um, uh, invaded the kingdoms of the Ismailis. Um, and he he had asked the Khalifa of Baghdad to support, to give some soldiers and support. Because the Khalifas were already giving tribute to the Mongols, even before. Um, and the Khalifa consulted his uh, entourage, saying that should we give troops for the conquest of the Ismailis um, and they told him no because the Hulaku Khan is hoping to weaken us so don't give him any troops so he didn't give any troops to Hulaku Khan and then the king after he finished with the Ismailis he turned to Baghdad and he said you did not send troops um, and the Khalifa he was frightened and consulted his vizier the names I mentioned was Ibn al-Alqami and Ibn al-Alqami told him Try to buy him off. 
many valuables must be prepared and sent off and you need to ask for forgiveness. Um, but the others told him, no, uh, the vizier is just trying to gain favor with the Mongols, don't listen to him. And what ends up happening is Ulaw Khan attacks. So in this contemporary version by Tusi, who's actually there at the siege of Baghdad, he's saying the reason why the Mongols attacked is not because we were invited by Ibn al-Qami, it's because after we finished with the Ismailis, we had to punish them for not being obedient to us after they had said they would be obedient, uh, be our vassals, right? So it had nothing to do with an invitation, right? And then one other source, and this last source on this topic, and then I'll, I'll sum it up. Um, Rashid al-Din's Jamit Tawarikh. This is writing around the same time as um, Ibn Kathir, maybe a little bit before. So um, early 1300s. Rashid al-Din was um, uh, a bureaucrat, actually a former Jew who had become a Muslim. Um, and he was a high official in the Mongol Empire. And he wrote uh, the most complete history. Um, and it's actually uh, quite an interesting book because he combines um, Chinese history and parts of other Asian history with Persian history and Arabic history to make this unique historical work called Jami' Tawarikh, um, the Compendium of Histories. And in it, he mentions, so he's right, he's a contemporary of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah actually hated him, <laughs> um, doubted whether he was even a Muslim. Uh, I think it's a little bit unfair, but um, a contemporary. He's actually met briefly when uh, uh, Ghazan uh, was in, in, in Damascus for a bit. Um, so in, in, in Rashid uh work, he, met, he begins by saying, uh, toward the end of the summer of 654, 1256, a huge flood came. And so inundated the city of Baghdad that the lower part of the in, in, uh, inhabited section disappeared underwater. For 50 days, the flood increased and then it began to subside. Half the outlying districts of Iraq were destroyed. Um, this was known as the Mu'tasimid flood uh, and is still proverbial in the mouths of the people of Baghdad. Um, during this activity, you know, there was a lot of rioting um, and then sort of the same thing as uh, Atusi that Hulaku Khan had asked for troops. Um, Baghdad had not given troops and as punishment, they came. The reason why I bring this up is because the issue of flooding is important. Uh, Baghdad was being mismanaged. So, you know, Baghdad is between two rivers. You have a number of canals that control the flooding of the rivers to make sure that um, one, it goes to agricultural areas and two, it doesn't destroy the city. That had not been, been reconstructed for like centuries. Um, and so Baghdad already was partially being destroyed. So in a sense, it was already a weakened city state without any like need to like get rid of the army or anything. It was already like this weakened state. And then on top of that, um, once they didn't send troops, Falahu Khan had determined to attack it. Why do I bring up these uh, different sources? Because in some sources, it seems like the reason the Mongols come is because they're invited by Ibn al-Qami, right? And I think uh, that's not really the full context, right? It's, it's likely, uh, the reason I say it's not the full context is because uh, a lot of the details about the Shia vizier are happening in sort of later sources during a time of heightened conflict with the Shia al Khanids. We don't see that many details in the earlier sources, such as in al Yunin, first of all. Secondly, when we look at other sources, um, they indicate that Hulaku Khan was going to attack whether or not they were invited. Uh, the Mongols were going to attack whether or not they were invited. Um, uh, and so, whether or not there was this Shia person who was collaborating um, would, is essentially immaterial. But the other thing is that it singles out the one Shia and it ignores all the Sunnis who are collaborating with the Mongols. Um, so a big part of that uh, chief amongst them was Badr Dina Lolo, right? So um, this is his biography from Imam Dhabi Sari al Islam. Um, but basically, um, he had been allied with the Mongols from beforehand. Um, and... Um, He's got, I mean, so it mentions, even that he mentions that, you know, he provided war equipment. Um, as we'll see, he was, he helped the Mongols conquer other cities. But he gets like this positive portrayal in the Habi Sadiq al-Islam and in Ibn Kathir. Um, uh, 
he, the Habib calls him, he was a determined, brave, resourceful, firm, wise, ge with generosity, strength, and political acumen. Like he was a brilliant political acumen. So he was a, he was all he was able to balance the Mongols and 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 the Khalifas and the Ayyubids. Um <clears throat> and so I just find it I find it strange <laughs> that he gets a pass. Um uh um, in, in the Arabic sources, but not in, in the Delhi Sultanate sources, who are removed. Um, he, he's as, as guilty as everybody else in those sources. And the other thing is that the thing he is criticized for is celebrating Christian holidays. Um, so there's some criticism for that, um, but not for helping in the massacre of, of Muslims. Um, what kind of massacre am I talking about? Well, let's compare him um, with Al-Malik Al-Kamil, the Ayyubid ruler of Maya Fariqin. Um, and this is also from Tariq al-Islam. Let, uh, let me go back to my slides just to show you where my, um, my Fariqin was. All right, so it's in, oh, so this was uh, Baduddin Lolo's kingdom right here around Mosul in Iraq. Um, and this is where my Fariqin, the principality was in, in modern day Turkey. All right, so you had, a, you had an Ayyubid ruler, a prince there. One of the few people that refused to bow down to the Mongols. Right, his name was Al Malik Al Kamil. Um, uh, I won't go through all of it. Uh, in Rashid Rashid ad Din's source, the, the official Mongol history, he's even more amazing because even before the conquest of Baghdad, he was trying to make unity amongst the Ayyubids to go and help the fight the Mongols in Baghdad, but no other Ayyubid prince would help him. Um, and because of that, because he was already trying to fight the Mongols and help them in Baghdad, uh, help fight them in Baghdad. After they get done with Baghdad, they go to Turkey to fight uh, uh, Al-Malik Al-Kamil um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Turkey, in Maya Fariqin. Um, and uh, they they besiege him for two years almost. The Habib says 20 months. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few passages because I think it, it, the original his source captures a lot of emotion. Um, they besieged him for about 20 months. And the fighting continued until most of the people in the city perished. Disease, famine, and inflation prevailed, and the situation worsened. Um, and um, so uh, that uh, uses a source whose father was there with, with uh, Al-Malik al-Kamil. And he says that Amalek, Amalek, the king Kamil used to go out to fight the Mongols, intimidating them. Um, then the, the Mongols built a city outside his city. Basically, they're besieging him. And the people of Maya Fadakin ran out of supplies. And they were starving and people were dying in their homes and their bodies were being eaten. And then the Mongols stopped fighting them and besieged them, right? So now there's no more really soldiers. So now they're besieging them. And in the end, some slaves from the city went out to the Mongols and informed them of the situation. But the Mongols didn't believe them initially because they didn't feel like they were going to give up. And when they went in, only about 70 people were still alive out of the thousands that had been there. Um, and Malik al-Kamil was still alive. Um, and so he was arrested and they took him um, to Halaku, who was headed to Aleppo. So when he goes there as a prisoner, Halaku gives him wine to, to humiliate him. And Malik al-Kamil says, you know, it's haram. So then Halaku tells his wife to give him wine, um, to belittle him even more. Um, and then Malik al-Kamil keeps his uh, demeanor and he says, uh, um, uh, and then after he refuses his wife, Halaku cursed and sp spits on, on Malik al-Kamil. And before that, um, so Malik al-Kamil had gone to the Mongol uh, capital in the Mongol empire before that. And Malik al-Kamil said, I thought you guys believe whoever sees the great Khan's face can't die. Yeah. So then at that point, Halaku gets so angry, he, he kills him right there and then. Right? So you've got this besiegement where entire population refuses to give up. Uh, Malik al-Kamil refuses to give up. No one comes to his aid. They starve to death I and mean, they become cannibals. In Rashid al-Din, he gives more details um, that I think is important because Rashid al-Din is the enemy, right? So he's providing important information about who he was fighting. And it says that there were, um, there were two fighters um, that kept killing several men and they fought hard. And after a time, they went to the city and they began to fight from the battlements. And there was someone there manning a catapult in, in, in Maya Fariqin, who was extremely accurate and killed many people with his projectiles. The Persian sources provide more information about siege warfare than the Arabic sources. 
I'm not, I'm not sure why. Um, but because of this, um, the Mongols asked um, uh, Badruddin Lutlun to bring his siege weapon. Um, but the, the Maya Fariqin siege weapons destroy those as well. Um, and then those two riders would come out every day, killing some people and then going back in. Um, it reminded me like Lord of the Rings where like they come out, kill people and go back into the castles. But this is what she's been talking about for two years. And then when the city is besieged, those two people who are still alive amongst the assembly keep fighting. And Malik al-Kamal tells them like, it's okay now to give up. But then they go up and start shooting with arrows. And then they start killing uh, with uh, swords until they're taken down. And uh, Colonel Rashid al-Din, Malik al-Kamal, before he's executed, he's actually tortured. His skin is ripped off by, by Hulagu's men and then he's executed. The point I bring up here, though, is because one, uh, I don't understand why someone like Badr al-Din al-Lutlu gets a pass, and only the Shias are singled out in our Sunni Muslim sources. Um, it's because there's references to war equipment that Badr al-Din provides, and the Persian sources make clear he's providing siege artillery, um, such as here. In, um, and this uh, is actually corroborated by a lot of... so. Rashid al-Din's book, uh, Jamit al um, it's famous because all the little uh, images we see a lot of times of Muslim history, like the ones I've been using, they're illustrated versions of his book. His book was extremely popular and people loved making images in his books. It's, um, so a lot of those images are really helpful to understand what was going on. Um, so for example, All right, so this is from uh, an image of Jawan Tariq. I want you to focus on the one, so this is catapult here, right? You got this person who is the one who's loading it and using it. And then you've got, oh, sorry. And you've got these other Mongol warriors here. What's different about this person compared to everybody else? Huh? Yeah, exactly, exactly, right? It's very likely that most of the people who are in charge of the artillery and the siege weapon were Muslims, like Badr al-Din Lutlu, right? Based on the images we have and based on references in Persian sources, right? I'm bringing that up because it wasn't just one Shia that caused, you know, the Mongol conquest. It was almost every single Muslim prince with exception of a few, like uh, Malik al-Kamil, who fought till the end. Um, I was going to mention a few other collaborators. You've got scholars who are collaborating. You've got um, the doctors. But I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the uh, part about Angelut um, because al Malik al-Kamil set, set the stage. He was the first one to really put up a fight. And he lasted almost two years with no help. With a small army and no help, two years. The Mongols had to keep sending reinforcements, right? And it really showed, and his head was actually paraded in, uh, in Damascus and hung up. But it it did it showed people that they're not invincible, right? These are they're not just going to come and roll through, um, and that that sacrifice mattered. Um, uh, I was going to mention some differences between um, Qutuz. Why? So at this point in time, twelve sixty, you've got a former slave from Central Asian lands who the Mongols had conquer, conquered and sold to the Ayyubid prince in Egypt. This slave former slave of the Mongols who had been sold to the Ayyubid prince of Egypt, um, overthrows the child that had been made the sultan. Once Hulaku Khan's, uh, once the, the um, Syria is taken over, after um, Maya Fariqin, he's like, this, this is enough. And he takes charge. His name is Qutuz. Um, <clears throat> I won't get into the differences in sources about why he, he, he um, decides to go on the offensive, but I find it interesting because it's not um, an obvious decision to leave Egypt, to cross the Sinai Desert, and choose to attack the Mongols. It would have been much harder for the Mongols to cross the desert and come to Egypt because there's no pasture lands in the Sinai. Remember, they're, they rely on, on cavalry, on ponies. They need lots and lots of pasture land. So strategically, if he wanted to hold Egypt, he could have held it. It'd be very difficult for the Mongols to cross over with their cavalry. But he decides to go on the offensive. 
Um, and uh, I'm, um, and it's not just him alone. Um, it's so it's not just uh, former slaves that are now sort of his allies, the the Turkic slaves who are now freed, but it's also uh, we mentioned the sources mentioned that you have the Persians, you've got Turks, you've got Bedouin Arabs, you've got Kurds, um, you've got a whole host of people that come together to support him. Um, I also wanted to mention the role played by um, Ezzedine Abdul Salam. Um, he was a senior scholar by this time in, in, in Cairo. And um, when the letter comes from Hulaku Khan, there's this letter where he says, basically, I'm coming. I am the grandson of Genghis Khan. You're a slave. I've destroyed everyone else. You've got nowhere to run to submit to me. All right, so this letter comes from Hulaku Khan. And this is important because the letter makes it clear that who, who Hulaku is, this grandson of this world conqueror, and who Qutuz is, basically a nobody, a former slave. Um, and he tells him, like, people like the Khalifa, like the Ayyubid princes, the children of Salah Hadin, they couldn't stand up to me. Who do you think you are? You were my, like, our former slave. So Qutuz, uh, takes counsel from his commanders and also he, from, from ulama. And Izzuddin Abdul Salam says, it is jihad is wajib on the world once they've conquered Syria. Right? So he's one of the few voices of the ulama that's very prominent. He actually has a history of speaking up. He was kicked out of Damascus as a khatib because he refused to call the, the ruler al-adil in the Jumma khutbah. He said, you're not adil. I'm not going to use that title. And he gives a fatwa saying, you can't make shifa'a by lying. And so he's he's kicked out of the Damascus mosque, right? So he's got a history, this, this um, amazing scholar, Rahimullah. So he's, he's wajib on the world to do jihad once they've conquered. And, um, uh, and it, but it's not like an open check. You can do whatever you want. As the dean says, the Mamluks, you can't tax the people until you have sold all your luxuries and all your possessions. And all you have left are your weapons. And only then you can come and ask the people to contribute through taxes. Right. So on the one hand, he's saying it's wajib, you gotta go out and fight them. But on the other hand, he's saying that doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Right? You still have to do justice. Um another point I want to uh mention, uh, and so I was gonna mention why I Makris's version, I won't go into it, but basically um another thing Qutuz does is that he reconciles with enemies, Muslim enemies. Uh Babers, Sultan Babers becomes the next uh, Mamluk ruler. They were had been enemies. He was also an excellent fighter and influential with lots of people following him. So Qutuz takes the step that's unusual of allying with one's Muslim enemy. No one was willing to do that. He does that. Um, and one reason I like Makrizi's version is that he's writing obviously a, a long time later, but a lot of the sources, uh, the early sources, they were written when the next Sultan, Sultan Babers, was ruling. Because Qutuz didn't really rule for long. He was assassinated by Sultan Babers right after the battle. And all these sources kind of make Babers a hero and make it seem like um, Sultan Babers and all the other Mamluks were pro-Jihad from the very beginning. And uh, Makhriz is writing a, a little bit later, but he's using earlier sources that some of them we don't have anymore. But he's saying they were cowards. <laughs> a lot of these Mamluks were cowards. Uh, Qutuz had to force them to go out to fight. Qutuz kills Hulaku's messengers. So now it's either Hulaku comes and massacres us, or we go out and fight him. There's no option of waiting anymore. Uh, Qutuz also, um, complete, um, uh, he marches them out. They move north of Egypt. Some of them are still reluctant to go. And Qutuz tells them, look, I'm going by myself. You want to come, you come. You want to go home, you go home. Right? Uh, and during the actual battle, uh, a lot of the earliest sources don't mention this, but uh, the Muslims start losing. <laughs> um, uh, initially, the Mongols are taken by surprise in Ain Jalut. They regroup and they attack again. And uh, Makrizi mentions that um, the Muslims were greatly shaken. Right, So he's removed far enough where he's okay. He's got that distance where he doesn't need to glorify this, the, all the people that were there. Um, like, like, like a lot of the earlier sources, they're more like really glorifying Babers and the Mamluks. And Qutuz, uh, Makrizi, he's actually very critical of the Mamluks. 
he thinks they're cowards during his time for not fighting Taymor, right? So he's got he's got no issues being critical. And he says there were, you know, Muslims were sh greatly shaken. And then Qutuz says his famous line, which isn't in a lot of the early sources, um, of, of Wa Islamah, three times, O Islam, O Allah, help your servant Qutuz against the Tatars, against the Mongols. And then he sort of um, regroups the Muslims um, after they were losing re-energizes them and then they take the initiative again um in the habib's version he says uh you know um oh the dean of muhammad but you know similar um um <clears throat> and so uh it's after this that the muslims uh the, so we say the mamluks but really it's it's mamluks it's it's persians it's kurds it's bedouin arabs um a lot of people that were left from the Syrian army that joined him um it was a muslim effort um, and I, I, I say that because in modern Egyptian textbooks, it's presented as an Egyptian victory, right? Mm -hmm. But that's important because it doesn't make sense. It only makes sense if you view it from the perspective of a Muslim victory. That's the only way you can take into account all the different people who are involved. That's the only way you can take it, take into account the importance of jihad. <laughs> um, Qutuz has to keep reminding them that we have to go. <laughs> that's the only way you can put into place the fatwa of Ajdi Abdul Salam telling them everybody, the whole world has to go. Um, and that's only to make sense of the fact that people were reluctant, but still went ahead. There's no like for the land of Egypt and none of that. You've got people who were who had uh, fled from other places in Syria that came and joined. Um, and so I really, it was a Muslim effort. Uh, and uh, in conclude, I mean, just as a conclusion, um, some academics argue that it wasn't a, a decisive battle, a consequential battle, because Muslims had about maybe 15, 20,000 people, uh, the Mongols maybe 10 to 12. So it wasn't like large numbers of 50, 80, 100, some other battles. Um, but I think that's really short sighted. One, because after this battle, more Muslims um, left being vassals of the Mongol Empire. Right, so that's really important. Right, uh, some people that had betrayed Muslims sort of side back with the Mamluks, um, and the other reason is because, and we see this in, in a lot of Ibn Taymiyyah's fatwas, people were still okay with like, okay, if the Mongols come, we're okay with it as long as we get to live our life. And Ibn Taymiyyah keeps saying, look, <laughs> you guys are the Mamluks of Ain, of Ain, of, of Ain Jalut. Like the whole reason you're allowed to be in power is because you defend Islam. Right, so this this becomes a really important way for people to keep telling the Mamluks that you're in service of Islam, and also to criticize them when they're not, like you're not living up to Qutuz. Right, so it becomes really important for that reason. And one last part I'll mention is that um, after the Mamluk Empire, after it's from the Mamluk time, they take on this title of um, Khadim al Haramain, uh, and it's it's a new title, uh, but they take it kind of seriously in that they invest a lot in building places in the Hijaz in Mecca and Medina. Um, a lot of madrasas. So this idea of having a school that has all four madhabs taught, like Allah said today, from the Mamluk times, um, you've got a lot of these schools that open up, um, these sort of universities open up in, in Mecca and Medina. Um, and uh, the historian Richard Bullitt makes this point that it's after the Mamluk times you see lots of people with the title of Al-Hajj. Al al like Hajj becomes a really important um, moment in Muslim lives after this time. You see lots of people with the title of Al-Hajj. Like uh, my grandfather, everybody calls him Haji Saf because he's done Hajj, right? That title that just like, oh, you've done Hajj, that's, that means a lot. We see that after the Mamluk times because they've invested so much in these areas. And that helps to unify a global Muslim community. Like Hajj becomes a place where you've got scholars that come from East Asia to Morocco and they mix and like their local um, interpretations mix and then it filtered yeah. out to other parts of the Muslim world. So really like the Mamluk victory, like from a global Muslim history perspective was really important <laughs> um, because it allowed all that to happen. And I'll, um, I I'll end it there um, with that conclusion. Um, and uh, apologies for going a little bit over, but I'll open up to any questions or comments. No, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ain Jalut was not quote unquote Egyptian event. Of course, it was, alhamdulillah, the effort 
of Muslims. It was an Islamic event. And even those who were from Egypt and joined uh, the effort, they didn't join because of being quote unquote Egyptians. Islam was their frame, it was the Egyptianism, it was not. So Alhamdulillah, and of course we need to learn more and more. But I would like to go back to the collapse of Baghdad, because to till now, we are suffering from that event. The historians of the Islamic Tashriya, Islamic law, who have the year 656 of Hijrah, when, when, when Baghdad was occupied by the Mongols, they mark it as the, big, the end of era and beginning of era regarding the Fukun. Asr al-Taqlid, al-Inhibat actually, the era of the decline in the Fukun because of what happened then. Uh, the context for what Ibn Arqami did, and by the way, it's not just Ibn Arqami, like you mentioned, Ibn Arqami and some other Sunni joined, joined that effort. But the one who gives good context for this, what happened, is Al Khomeini himself. Al Khomeini himself, in his book, Al Hukumat Islamiyya, uh, complemented what Ibn Al Arqami and Nasir al Din did. And he said that joining the Sultan is not permissible uh, unless it, it serves our madhab as what Ibn uh, Al Arqami and Nasir al Din did. That really gives a context to what, to what they did. And an, another point I would like to mention, some people are trying to undermine the position of Khilafah because of what happened. So they'll tell you, look, there was Khilafah, and yet Baghdad collapsed, and yet the Crusaders uh, came, invaded, and this and that. The, the, what needs to be realized, actually, is that Khilafah is not a magic solution. Khilafah provides us with a, with a mechanism, with a platform, energizes Muslim Ummah under one central leadership. It will not eliminate the problems. It will not prevent problem, some problems from happening, but it will, will provide us with good mechanism, effective mechanism, so that we face these challenges. So what the weakness in, the, in, the, in, the, in our history shouldn't be a reason to undermine uh, the authority or the, the legitimacy of the Khilaf. Barakallah for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, great points. Um, I was going to mention that uh, in uh, Al Yunini's history, he's the only one that I saw that mentioned this. That uh, he mentions that when the conquest of Baghdad is happening, um, is the Dina Abdul Salam in Egypt says that Muslims need to be doing with uh, Qunut in every single prayer um, for Baghdad. Um, uh, so I, there's this perspective that Muslims like like it, um, it mattered to them, you know, and that fall mattered too because it, it you know. Uh, Malik al-Kamil refuses like you killed the Khalifa like yeah. I'm not going to give up um, uh, in, in Rashid al-Din's version uh, when they besiege him they've captured his family and they show his wife his uh, wife and children and he says look you come down we'll promise you safety and your family safety and then Malik al-Kamil says you killed the Khalifa I've got nothing to give you except my sword um, uh, so like it was I mean and it speaks to a larger problem. And right? this is something that I came up with when I was doing my research. The problem of like collective Muslim action. Like I, if I put, try to put myself in that place. Like if I'm one of these people in these cities, um, I'm a merchant or I'm a prince. Like would I be fighting the Mongol empire or would I be collaborating? Uh, I mean, if we, if we teach like people here or our children or our community, like keep your head down, you know, just do well in school, do well in your job, you know, like, don't, don't make a trouble. <laughs> don't wear the kafiya might be a hate crime. You know, you like, like, wh what are we teaching them then? You know, like, like, it, it, I feel like this is the type of lesson that would lend itself to being like, it's okay, because they're in power, the Mongols are in power. And, you know, when Allah wills, he'll change it, you know, like, how, what would we be doing? I, and I was thinking about that. Um, uh, you know, how, how many of us would be like the people who are willing to starve to death, uh, willing to become cannibals and then starve to death, um, rather than cutting a deal? Um, and like, you've got some scholars that cut a deal and ask Hulaku to make them chief judges and give them control over the Madrasat in Damascus. 
And Imam Dhabi mentions this. Like they, before Hulaku came, they crossed the Euphrates and said, hey, um, I'll help you make me and my family the, uh, the people in charge of these madrasas in Damascus. Um, and, you know, hey, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm teaching fiqh. I'm teaching the book of Allah. Um, I'm keeping the peace. Uh, isn't this better than um, us, all of us being killed for no reason? Um, but, like, if we didn't have some people that were thinking like that, like Al-Malak Al-Kam and Al-Qutuz, then where would Islam be? Um, so, I mean, that's that's what I was left with. Like, this problem of collective action. And I think history is important because, like, Ibn al is looking at it historically. And he sees what's happening in East Asia is connected to him in Iraq, right? History connects us. The, the, these They're not just stories. And that's one of the things I want to take away from this, is that, a lot of times we're just fed stories that are histories, but when we delve into it, like we get connected to these people and we get connected to what's happening and, and it helps us to, to position ourselves in time. Like I am connected to Ain Jalut. I am connected to the fall of Baghdad. Right. And so that, that really psychologically shapes our identity making. And I, that's why I think like history is so important to learn in that way. Not feel good stories, although sometimes they make us feel good, but also tragedies that make us feel bad for what's going on and like make us think like, what could I do now? I don't want to be a collaborator. Sound like, like a probably a murder word. Um, in your research, were you able to come across anything what was going on internally with the Mongols back home? You guys read a while back uh, that they're maybe one of the leaders that died or something. Did you come across anything like that? Yeah, so that's an important context is that when uh, Hulaku Khan um, comes to Syria, and Syria gives up easily after the conquest of Baghdad, uh, people just, um, nobody fights. People are consent and submit. Um, the only Ayyubid prince that doesn't is the one that uh, Al Malik al Um And so then after he, after he comes, um, his brother, who was the great Khan, uh, Monke Khan, passes away. And his other brother, Kublai Khan, wants to take control. So, and also, um, he's got uh, some tension with what's called the Golden Horde in Russia, that part of the Mongol. So he he takes most of his army. So maybe like 80,000, leaving 10 or 20,000 behind. But he takes most of them and, and moves out. Uh, moves east. Um, and that's where he really sets up a separate empire called the Ilkhan, right? So that's important. The the Mongol numbers were greatly reduced when when they fought at Ain Jalut. It was 10, 12,000, not 100,000, 80,000 that the other armies faced. But I think that's also an important reminder is that so much of what will happen is beyond our control. Uh, it's up to Allah. And we have to be willing to do our little part. And with Tawfiq Allah, there will be success. And even if there isn't, this is Allah's will, right? So for Malik al-Kamil, it wasn't the right time, but he was doing what he could do. For Qutuz, same thing. He didn't know they were going to win, right? People think that 10,000, the Mongol army is nothing, right? This is the same army that just conquered all of Asia, right? Qutuz's army are ragtag, some Mamluks, some Kurds, some Bedouins, some Persians, people who have never fought together. Many of them who don't want to go fight, right? So you've got um, this well-oiled fighting machine in the Mongols versus, you know, a motley crew of Muslims, right? So this wasn't by, and that's why Al-Maqrizi mentions, like they were about to lose. Um, the Mongols regrouped and attacked again and the Muslims were shattered, he says, um, until it was, the point being that a lot of it is beyond human control, but that doesn't mean we're not responsible. Like, and, and if we do what we have to do, eventually Allah will provide an opening, right? So we might find ourselves in situation of Malik al-Kamil. That's Allah's. And we might find ourselves in position of Qutuz, and that's up to Allah, right? But we still have to do what we can do as humans. Yeah. yeah. So then he wanted to also avenge the sack of Baghdad. Sorry, who? Uh, Burki Khan. Which yes, Burki. yeah. So you, when you do have, um, eventually, Burki Khan becomes Muslim um, as well. Um, but, um, you know, that's a little bit later. But yes, like, ultimately, you do, it does lead to the spread of Islam, right? But 
that doesn't change the fact that we still have we not we we can't tell what's gonna happen in the future. <laughs> Obviously, you know, so this I because some, some people use this like bad things happen, let it happen because ultimately Allah will some good let some good come out of it. But again, it's our responsibility. Like what what taklif, what obligation has Allah put on us? We can't predict the future, right? So and maybe inshallah, good will come out of bad. But that doesn't remove our duty to fight the bad. <laughs> One final question. Um, something that Uthman already mentioned a couple of weeks ago is uh, post 9-11, uh, the, the kids who are growing up, right? A lot of them getting educated in, in the Islamic universities in Medina and this and that. They're becoming, uh, well, I guess, apolitical. They didn't know this, the political side of Islam, you know. So, I mean, as an Umar, how do we tackle that issue? Yeah, I mean, it, I, that's a good question. How do we I think, like, learning history is really important. So, like, history as a discipline is not has you know like there's no like usul tarif like there is like usul hadith usul fiqh and usul tafsir and um like it it is in many ways like there isn't that serious attention to it um uh and that's why people can play around with it and present stories um or present like nationalist rhetoric um but it's really hard <laughs> to present nationally nationalist histories of Islam because it just doesn't fit. Um, like you've got Muslims from all across the world that um, are are aware that we're all Muslims from all across the world, um, uh, and I, I think like history is really like seriously like looking at history shows one like how political uh, many people were for for the good, and it also shows how messed up things get when a lot of Muslims don't care about politics because then the rulers like if we think like rulers know what they're doing they don't. Like all throughout history, they don't like they're they're terrible uh, unless they're pushed and forced into the right ways, unless they're nudged. Um, and so, I, I think history makes that clear. Take one actually final final question. Then one. Uh, Jazakallah khair. Yeah. Uh, so going back to your origin when you started looking at history. So uh, in today, when people read history, they look at it like this: facts, events, and that's it. I just read it. But you mentioned when you read history, because you pro you provided us actually a scientific versus, you know, before history was just read a bunch of facts that said as some sort of critical looking at who's their source and comparing the source and come up to some sort of understanding of what actually happened. So can you comment on that of uh, going forward, uh, picking up a history book or uh, any recommendation you have to for people who want to read or study history, how should they approach it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so you want to begin with like secondary sources, meaning you want to begin with um, people who, who who are using primary sources, but you know not primary and sources itself. Find the primary sources. Sure. Right. Source, right. So one. yeah, sure. That's thanks. Um, a lot of my job is this actually is ta talking to college students about these differences. Yeah. Um, so you want to begin with um, looking at history books that are written by like contemporary scholars or relatively contemporary, um, not like ancient scholars, um, academics or even Muslim scholars. Um, uh, like there, there's um, a Salabi has a, a great history book in Arabic, also on Ain Jalut. Um, so it's not just Muslim uh, Western academics, but it's also Muslim scholars. But you want, but my point being is you want to start with like our research work and look at the sources that are being used. I mean, that's how, I am not a specialist. I, I did not know like, you know, Okay, Yunini came before the Habi and the Habi came. I mean, I kind of know the Habi named Kathir, but you know, I didn't know like you know. So I I looked at what people have written, and then I like look at their, um, what what their arguments are, what they're saying, and then look at their what sources they're using, um, and then if you're able to, um, read those sources for yourself, read those footnotes for yourself. Um, for example, I read one uh, person that was saying that uh, the Habi is like he's different from Ibn Kathir because he doesn't call Ibn Al Qami Rafidli and um, he no, he does. Like you just looked in the wrong section. <laughs> um, so like, yeah, look at the footnotes. Um, uh, and then uh, you start looking at if you can. And we're living at a time when a lot of these sources are available in English. Like some things I translate myself, but some things like they're already available in English. So I was able to just you know copy that and type that. Um, and then you want to look at and I always question like like I was saying like whether it's 
a contemporary book of history, like what is it doing? Or even these older sources that are being footnoted and cited in Arabic or any other language, what is it doing? Um, uh, who is it? Like, where is it, what time period is it from? And then like, and that takes a little bit more work, but like everyone is coming from a position, you know? Uh, I've made that position clear. I am speaking as a committed Muslim in Ramadan during Gaza conflict, the, the genocide. That's not my mind, right? So if I'm writing a history right now of Angelut, obviously that perspective is going to pull me. H having like these subjectivities is not bad as long as you're still being scholarly, as long as you're showing your evidences and you're showing, you're engaging other people, like other scholars, like there's nothing wrong with that. Um uh, I don't like when people hide their perspectives because they claim to be quote unquote neutral. Then you're hiding something, I feel like. Um, so uh, one, like, yeah. So, and but the biggest thing is like, you have to have this interest um, to not take things at face value. And this becomes really important when there's so much misinformation out there and it's easy to just take things at face value, uh, but you don't, you don't. <laughs> so yeah, start with contemporary sources, look at the footnotes. If you can't access it, go into the footnotes. Um, yeah, see what other people are saying. Always cross check and compare. Um, and definitely try to come up with your own perspective. Um, just, you don't want to tuck lead in, in history. That doesn't mean you have to always disagree, but it's really important to have your own perspective. Um, you, you don't have to be a scholar. I am not a scholar of Mamluk history or Mongol history. Um, I had my own perspective though. Um, and it's always great if you can uh, discuss it with others. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring some of these sources is because I knew there's other people that are more knowledgeable that would have valuable things to add to me. Um, so yeah, those are my, sorry, with contemporary sources, look at the footnotes. If you can look at older sources, cross check what other people are saying, and then talk about it. Yeah. Would that 